Well, we're continuing our message series where we're looking at what the Bible says about various things. This morning we're asking the question, what does the Bible say about the end times? Now that's a big question, right? A very big question. We're only going to be able to scratch the surface. In fact, last night was kind of funny. We had our teens here. They were just wrapping up their 30-hour famine. They were in like hour 29, right, where they, they go without eating to raise money for kids who are hungry, which is an awesome thing that our teens did. But that meant that like the sooner I finished talking, the sooner they ate. So when I announced that topic, I could kind of see their faces drop like, oh no, this is going to go forever. Well, I promise we won't go forever. We're just going to scratch the surface. But what does God's Word say about the end times? It's a popular thing to discuss. In fact, it's uh, quite popular even uh, in just society in general. How does the world end? We look at that in movies all the time. In fact, we've got a mashup here this morning of a bunch of movie trailers, just a few of the ones, that talk about this, how the world is supposedly going to end. So check this out. Maybe you'll recognize one of your favorites here. Are you aware of an impending attack on the planet Earth? That as men busied themselves about their various concerns, they observed and studied. With infinite complacency, men went to and fro about the globe, confident of their empire over this world. I think we love these movies because we love to blow stuff up, right? That's fun. And so we, we love to, to talk about these things. And there's so much speculation around it because, of course, the Bible has been, has talks about the end of times considerably, uh, in a considerable amount. Jesus talked about it a lot. Uh, the New Testament gives us some signs that we should be watching for. In fact, in 2 Timothy, 1 Thessalonians, it says that some of the ways we'll know that we're in the end times when things will be difficult. People will be obsessed with themselves. There'll be wars, rumors of wars, uh, overwhelming greed, pride, ignoring God. Sound anything like our world today? <laughs> yes. Does it sound anything like the world 500 years ago? Yes. <laughs> this is the human condition, right? And see, once Jesus came to this earth, he lived, he died, he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and he's going to come again someday. Ever since that time when Jesus departed, ascended into heaven, we've been living in the last days. Okay, We know that because Jesus promised that he would be back. So today we continue to wrestle with this issue of time frame. What's that mean? How long is it going to be? Because God's timing and our timing are, are clearly different. We work on a much shorter time frame. If I live a normal amount, I probably got, what, 75, maybe if I'm lucky, 100 years here on this planet. God's got all of eternity to deal with. So, so time can be a little bit different for us. And, you know, this is an important topic. It's important because it should motivate us to live for Jesus, knowing that our time here could be quite short. Followers of Jesus oftentimes make, make two mistakes, one of two mistakes uh, when looking at the end times. One mistake would be to pretend like it's irrelevant. You know, Jesus hasn't come back yet. It's been a long time, so it's probably not going to happen anytime soon. So let's not worry about it. Let's not think about it. Well, to do so is to live completely contrary to the teachings of Jesus. 
Because he taught over and over and over that we need to be watching in expectancy, waiting in expectancy for his return. Okay, so he was very clear. He's coming back. We need to be ready. But the other extreme is also dangerous. The other extreme is to become obsessed with this stuff to the point where we don't take care of business like we should here in this world. Because, see, we're called to be good stewards of our lives, of this planet, of all these things. And, and that means that we shouldn't just treat our lives like, like they're throwaway things. Because, hey, Jesus is coming back like tomorrow or the next day, so it doesn't matter. That's, in a, that's also a mistake. We, we must not fall into either of those. So what does the Bible say about the end times? Well, just a few things this morning. First, Jesus will return, okay? That's very, very clear in Scripture, very, very clear in the teachings of Jesus. Many place he ta- places he talks about this. Uh, John chapter 14 is one of those where he says this, Don't be troubled. You believe in God. Now also trust in me. There are many rooms in my Father's home. If it were not so, so or excuse me, I go to prepare a place for you. If it were not so, I would tell you plainly. When everything is ready, I will come and get you so that you will always be with me where I am. So Jesus says, okay, I'm here with you now, talking to his disciples, but soon enough, I'm going to go away. I'm going to prepare a place for you. Then I'm going to come back and I'm going to get you. So I'm coming back again. It's kind of illustration that he gives, so, you know, saying we need to wait while he goes away, prepares a place for us because he's coming back soon. So we know that he's coming back. Uh, the basic belief about Jesus that Christians have is that Christ has died, Christ has risen, Christ will come again. We've held, held these beliefs ever since Jesus was here and will continue to hold them. Second thing is that this world is only the beginning. Okay, We, we live in this world where it can be very frustrating at times. It can be very upsetting. It can, uh, there's so many things. I mean, what just this past week, another movie theater shooting, right? Senseless violence. We see around the world how children die every few seconds because of starvation or malaria or all these different causes. Say, this isn't how God intended the world to be. We see horrible genocide. We look back to the horrible Adolf Hitler genocide in World War II or or today through ISIS. And we see horrible hate uh, being spread, evil being spread. And it's easy to look at this world and be so down, be so discouraged, to be so upset, because these things, they should upset us. Sin breaks God's heart, and it should break our hearts too. The Bible tells us to love what is good and to hate what is evil. But by the same token, we know that what we experience today is not the final thing. The the problems of this world, they don't last forever. The Bible's very clear that ultimately good wins out over evil. The book of Revelation is this incredible vision that John had, um, and it gives this this vision of of the fallen Babylon world that we live in, this, this evil fallen world, and puts it in contrast with the new Jerusalem that is to come. And while we live in fallen Babylon today and we wrestle with this, we have this great hope of the new Jerusalem that is to come. Revelation 21, verse 1 says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the old heaven and the old earth had disappeared, and the sea was also gone. And I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, like a beautiful bride prepared for her husband. Then I heard a loud shout from the throne, saying, Look, the home of God is now among His people. He will live with them, and they will be His people. God Himself will be with them. He will remove all of their sorrows, and there will be no more death or sorrow or crying or pain. For this old world and its evils are gone forever. You looking forward to a world like that? I sure am. I could do with a lot less sin, a lot less evil. We, we, we go through these pains where we lose loved ones. Uh, we, we, we watch our loved ones suffer and die, and it hurts so much. There's so much sorrow. There's so much disappointment. Our kids grow up, and they make these decisions that we say, oh, I never raised them to live this way. So many disappointments and sorrows. And yet, we have this incredible hope, because this is not all there is to it. Followers of Jesus, we should have 
the greatest hope of anybody out there. Because if this world is all there is, it's a really sad and depressing place. Oftentimes, evil goes unpunished and good goes unrewarded. Yet we believe in a new Jerusalem, in, in a new heaven, a new earth, where, where these evils of fallen Babylon are gone because Jesus is ultimately victorious. He's ultimately victorious over evil. And that is the great hope that we have. And it's a hope that we should be living into this day. The third thing we learn from the Bible is that we don't know when Jesus will return. We don't. (laughs) The reason we know that we don't know is because Jesus said that we won't know. And we got to make sure that we don't forget that. Matthew 24, 36 says this, However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen, not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. So Jesus is saying in his time here on earth, even he wasn't fully aware when that time frame would be. Yet Christians often mess this one up. We, I, I knew of a guy one time where um, he was a Sunday school teacher in a church that I served. And in a five-year period, he predicted the return of Christ three different times. He was wrong about all of them, by the way. But that didn't seem to slow him down, nor discourage him, nor those group of people who would listen to him. He didn't teach Sunday school after a while, after a while there, because he said, you've got to quit doing this. You know, you're leading people astray. He lived without, without health insurance and, and without retirement savings, because he was confident that was all unnecessary. And if he's right, hey, that's wonderful. I, I hope one of his dates comes true one day. But so far, they haven't. And he's not the first to make this mistake. There's a a book written, uh, The 88 Reasons Why the Rapture Will uh, Happen in 1988. It was a great seller about 1986 and 1987. Sales chilled out a lot about 1989, though, right? Because Jesus was abundantly clear. You won't know when it's going to happen. As my Sunday school teacher friend would say, he'd say, well, we won't know the day or the hour, but that doesn't mean we won't know the weekend, right? Wrong. (laughs) Jesus said, we're not going to know. We got to accept Jesus' words for what they are. I mean, Jesus himself said that. Christians have been making this mistake for a long time. Uh, You've probably heard of, you may have heard of Harold Camping. Uh, He passed away recently, but Harold was known for predicting dates. In fact, he'd even take out billboards like this one here, the Lord's coming May 21st. That didn't happen either, by the way, just in case you're wondering. The problem is it really undermines the credibility of Christianity because people who don't know what the Bible says assume that the Bible must have said that. Otherwise, why on earth would somebody take out a billboard, right? Well, somebody else took out another billboard to remind of the other days where Harold was wrong. Harold would later say, to his credit before his death, he said it was wrong and sinful for him to do this. He should never have predicted this because Jesus said otherwise. His ministry literally made millions of dollars every time he'd give one of these false predictions. I think that's tragic. Because Jesus said, you won't know the day or the hour. Why don't we feed people instead? Why don't we help the world around us that's in need instead of wasting millions of dollars on that kind of stuff? AD 1000, go back over a thousand years from now. uh, Many believed a very literal thousand year period between Jesus' uh, ascension and Jesus' return. And so some members of the church, even actually uh, some Christian armies actually went out and attacked non-Christian areas trying to force them to convert to to be followers of Jesus because they believed the time was limited. Well, if Jesus gave us free will, (laughs) who are we to try to take that away from somebody? You can only come to Christ by choosing. It can't be forced upon you. In fact, in that same time period, many people gave their entire, all the money that they had to the church because they felt Jesus was coming back immediately so they wouldn't need it. Now, I don't understand what they thought the church was going to do with it, though, because mathematically speaking, they wouldn't need it either, right? I mean, if we really believe that, we should be, giving, we should be saying, hey, take a chair home with you this week. We won't need them next week, right? And unfortunately, in those days, the church actually, after Jesus did not come back, they didn't give those gifts back. And they got into a lot of trouble, reasonably so, right? Because it was kind of some false advertising. Jesus told us we're not going to know, so we're simply put, we're not going to know. And that's okay. I can't tell you exactly when Jesus will return. 
We know we've been living in the end times for the past 2,000 years. Are we to the end of those times? Perhaps. Perhaps not. I don't know. What, what I do know is that while I'm not sure when the end times are coming, I am quite sure that my end times are coming in the relatively near future, say 70 years or less probably for me. That would have me at 105, so that would be pretty good, wouldn't it? Probably a lot less than that. And for some of you, it might even be a shorter time frame than me. I'm not calling anybody old, but you know, we all have our time frames, right? Our end times are coming. They are. I could get hit by the bus today, okay? Jesus could come back today. The issue is not a matter of, of if. It, it, it is going to happen. It's a matter of being prepared. Fourth thing we learn from studying the Bible is that interpretation is not easy. We've got a Bible here. See, uh, Revelations, uh, Revelation, the final book of the New Testament, is 16 pages out of this Bible. Okay, that's not the only apocalyptic or end-time literature, but that's some of the key uh, information. This book here not 16 pages, this one is 1147 pages, and this is a commentary purely on the book of Revelation. Somebody wrote 1100 some pages, I know that, I had to read them all during seminary, and if you've had trouble sleeping lately, I've got a great book for you to read. Because interpretation is tough, it is. Scholars have debated, will always debate extensively about this stuff, and that's okay. The Bible is abundantly clear about so many issues. We love God, we love others. That's why we exist. There's other issues like in the end times that are much more complex to understand because there's a lot of metaphor that's used. And with metaphor, we try to interpret it. We got to understand what it meant in their era before we can understand what it means in our era. This is where a lot of people get messed up about end times stuff. They'll read passages from the Bible and they'll say, oh, that passage is talking about helicopters or nuclear warfare or, or and when I was young it was Gorbachev. Today it's, I don't know, who we play, ISIS probably today or um, every sitting U.S. president. That's been the Antichrist by somebody, right, depending on your political position. It's always, it, people always will make that mistake of instead of trying to understand the Bible for when it was written, they try to treat it like it's some magic book that has been totally irrelevant for the past 2,000 years, but today it must be relevant to us in this moment. That's not a good look at Scripture. The Bible's God's Word. It's always been God's Word. And we understand it best by understanding what it meant, originally meant. Like one simple example, there's, there's many of these. Uh, Revelation 13, 18, it's talking about the beast. Many people uh, tie this in with other passages talking about an antichrist. Uh, Revelation 13, 18 says, Wisdom is needed to understand this. It means it's complicated. Let the one who has understanding solve the number of the beast, for is the number of a man... His number is 666. Okay, so what in the world does that mean? It says it's a number of a man. Is this like, I mean, how do we understand that in our terms? We, well, we number athletes, right? Like Michael Jordan, number 23. So, so that means like the beast is going to show up wearing this like 666 jersey or something like, oh, I should have known, right? He's got the jersey on. <laughs> Not likely, right? Not likely. If we read this in its original context, we would know, if, if we were Jews 2,000 years ago, we'd be familiar with the common practice they had, which was ascribing a number to names. How would they do this? Well, you would take the, the value, the numerical value of the letters in the name, um, like, you know, for me, J is the 10th letter in the alphabet, right? Like 10, right? So they, they would take that and put together a formula to come up with a number. So your name could mean a specific number. Well, that number 666 is interesting because if you take the full name, of the emperor Nero, who was the leader of fallen Babylon, which Revelation is talking about. Uh, he was the leader of fallen Babylon in that day, very evil man, martyred uh, just countless numbers of Christians very violently. And uh, Nero's number, if you add it all together, is 666. Now, interestingly, in the Bible, that's uh, in Greek versions of the New Testament, uh, that the number is always 666. But in, in Latin versions of those er, that early era, uh, the, the Bible was written sometimes in Latin to be sent to uh, northern Africa where they spoke Latin at that time, uh, the number would be 636. In fact, some of your Bibles may even have a note that say 666, and it'll say down there, or 636. 
And so the interesting thing is when you add Nero's name together in Latin, the number is 636 because it's spelled differently, right? So here you've got a pretty clear reference to one specific person. Yet how much time has been spent trying to ascribe this number to a whole variety of people in our current context? you got to know it in its original context if you're going to understand it today. And the Bible's really clear. You've got fallen Babylon, where they lived in those days, where we live today. And whether you've got Nero, or you've got Hitler, or you've got ISIS, wherever it is, you've got the face of evil. And it's really easy to see that and to think there's no hope. How would we ever overcome that? And yet, if you read Revelation, you know that there is hope. Because ultimately, Jesus is victorious over all this. Jesus puts fallen Babylon in his place. It's not the final score, my friends. We have incredible hope because we've read the end of the book. And Jesus wins out. He wins out. And that is the key thing that we've got to understand about the end times. People will continually be debating about the mechanics of all this stuff. Like, we've got a chart about this stuff. This is something somebody made. It's kind of interesting. I'm not going to take you through all of it. Uh, but they've got, here, this person thinks they've got it all figured out. You can't even see it. Even on this giant screen, it's still too small. They've got little verses for all of these different phases and stages and all this stuff. And here, this guy is pretty sure he's got it all figured out. Is he right? I don't know. Maybe. But guess what? There have been people doing this for generations so far, they've all been wrong. Is this guy right? Maybe, maybe not. Quite frankly, I'm not that concerned about it. I'm concerned about something very different, which is the fact I know the end times is coming for me in the relatively near future, so I need to be ready. Regardless of any charts or debates or any of that kind of stuff, I don't really have time for that, because what I know is we've got a world who doesn't know Jesus, and they need to know Jesus. I've only got a certain number of years to be here on this earth, and I don't want to waste them piddling around with stuff that I'm not going to understand. I want to spend my time loving those who need love, sharing Jesus with everybody that I can, because I'm so far 35 years through my time here on this earth, and if I met Jesus today, I want to be able to give an answer for how I've spent that time. Because the fifth thing, bottom line, we need to always be ready for Jesus' return could be this afternoon. Are you ready? Are you ready? It could be when you die someday. Maybe many years. I hope many years down the road for you. But it could be sooner. Whatever it is, are you ready? Jesus said this in Matthew. When the Son of Man returns, it will be like it was in Noah's days. In those days before the flood, the people were enjoying banquets and parties and weddings right up until the time Noah entered the boat. People didn't realize what was going to happen until the flood came and swept them all away. That's the way it will be when the Son of Man comes. Two men will be working together in the field. One will be taken, the other left. Two women will be grinding flour at the mill. One will be taken, the other left. So be prepared, because you don't know that what day your Lord is coming. Know this, a homeowner who knew exactly when a burglar was coming would stay alert and not permit the house to be broken into. You must also be ready all the time. For the Son of Man will come when it is least expected. Friends, the question that really matters is not when is Jesus coming again? No, the question that matters is are you ready? I don't control the time frame. You don't control the time frame. But I have a lot of control over whether or not I'm ready. How do I get ready? Well, it begins by giving my life to Jesus saying that I've got this, this sin problem, that my sins have separated me from God. And the Bible tells us that the payment for sins is death. That's what sin leads to. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And that God loves us so much that He gave His own Son for me, for you. Because i got a lot of problems. i got a lot of sin. I need a lot of forgiveness. You probably do too. And yet Jesus, He paid that price for me and for you so that we can live eternally with Him. That's how it begins. That's the first step in readiness for Jesus' return. Then it continues the rest of our lives, living for Jesus. Because if you really believe this stuff, if you believe that there is a heaven and there is a hell, I want everybody to go to heaven. I want everybody to know Jesus. I don't want anybody to be separated from Jesus. So consequently, I want to live my life 
in a way that's going to lead the most people to Jesus possible. I want to be generous with my time and talents and resources. I, I want to be loving. I want to be caring. I want when people to see me that they see Jesus. And that should be all of our goals. And myself and none of us do it perfectly. But we want to be a church that is ready for His return. Like that bride who's waiting for the groom. We want to be ready for Jesus' return. Because it's going to happen someday. It's going to happen someday. And we want to be ready. Are you ready? I'm going to pray in a moment here. And I invite you, you might want to pray along with me. Maybe you've never made that decision. Maybe you're sitting here and saying, no, I, I am not ready. I've not dealt with that sin problem in my life. Let's deal with that right now. Jesus wants to, to come into your life right here, right now in this place. You can invite him in. It's, it's this incredible free gift. See, Jesus, he doesn't force himself upon anybody in anybody's life. No, he offers this gift. You've got to reach out and take it. He won't force you to, but he invites you to. Won't you accept that this day? Jesus, I need you. I'm a sinner. I have disappointed you so many countless times. I failed to live up to the calling that you have for my life. And I just ask that you'd forgive me, that you would heal me, that you would restore me, that you would make my life more like you. Lord, I pray for all those who perhaps have prayed that prayer before, but we've slipped away, Lord. Would you, would you call us back to yourself? Would you renew us and restore us this day that our lives would be honoring and pleasing to you? That we would live lives that are truly ready for your return. Lord Jesus, I pray that we would be a people who is spreading the good news about you here in Dayton, in the United States, and around the world so that others can come to know you more fully, Lord Jesus. Lord, we love you and pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.